Well, hello there. That is my special intro. Uh, this week, you guys are reading, I sent you guys another story. Uh, it's not a grim story. Uh, it is uh, from the Arabian Nights, A Thousand and One Nights. Um, it's a collection of stories that predates the Grimm stories by centuries. Um, they were from the Middle East, um, and they, the Middle East, uh, the Muslim culture there was spreading all over Asia and, and through Africa and into Europe as well. They were um, uh, seafarers, they rode, they, you know, got on their boats uh, from uh, the Middle East, and they went to India, they went to Indonesia, they went to Africa, they traveled around, and they collected stories, and they put the stories together in what we call the Arabian Nights. Sinbad is uh, a collection there in this book I have, it is The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor, and it starts off by this poor porter. A porter is someone who carries things. Um, and uh, a common uh, character in these stories is this poor porter named Sinbad, who is moaning about how horrible life is and how the rich got it easy and he's just a miserable porter. And inside, the master, whose name happens to be Sinbad, calls him in and says, well, let me tell you my story. I used to be just like you, and now I'm a rich man. And the reason I became a rich man is I traveled around the world as a merchant, and I was Sinbad the sailor. Uh, so uh, you, we, you guys are reading just one of them, um, The Fifth Voyage. Uh, where is it? Do I have the right page? The Fifth Voyage. The Fifth Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor. Hey, do you recognize the illustrator? It's got illustrations in it. You guys recognize who drew these? Those pencil and ink drawings? Uh, Quentin Blake, same guy who uh, uh, drew the illustrations for Fantastic Mr. Fox. Um, one of my favorites. One of the reasons I got this book way back when. Okay, let's read a story. What the heck? Fifth Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor. There are lots of words in this in this uh, story that you're gonna you're gonna go, huh? Uh, and it's okay. It's what reading is about. You 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 get you read them. You go, what's that word? And some of these you have to look up. Some of them I'll help you with. Some of them you'll figure out by context which means if you are um, uh, seeing a word for the first time, you can oftentimes figure out what it means just by the, the sentence that it's in. Um, I was gonna think of an example, but I'm, I need more coffee before I can do that. So let me just drink some more coffee right now, because you never know what's gonna happen. All right, once again, my life of uninterrupted pleasure soon made me forget all the dangers and suffering I had endured on my voyages. And finally, my urge to travel to foreign parts seized me with all its previous force. I used my experience to buy the most appropriate equipment and goods for my journey and had them transported to Basra. Basra is a city in Iraq, still there. There in the port, I discovered a brand new boat that took my fancy so much that I bought her on the spot. I then hired a skilled master and crew above whom I set certain of my stewards as overseers. A number of rich merchants offered me money to take them and their goods, which I accepted, and I immediately gave orders to set sail. We journeyed from city to city and island to island, selling and buying profitably, making some money profitably, until one day we arrived at a desolate island, desolate, nothing there, on the shore of which could be seen a white dome-shaped object half buried in the sand. While I was attending to necessary matters on board ship, the merchants landed and began to investigate the dome. Not knowing what it was, they began striking it with stones to discover what was inside. It was, in fact, a rock's egg and they soon broke the shell with their stones. Water gushed from the egg, revealing a baby rock inside. At once the merchants decided to light a fire and make a meal of the bird, to which purpose they began struggling to pull it out of the shell. One of the crew, seeing this, immediately reported the matter to me, which, of course, filled me with horror. 
For pity's sake, leave the egg alone and return to the ship, I called, or the great rock will see you attacking its young and will attack us in return. I command you to come back on board before it is too late. But it seemed it was too late. The sun darkened as the male rock's mighty wings blotted out the light. The bird circled the little group on the shore, making angry cries. Alerted by its calls, its mate appeared, and the two of them wheeled overhead, sending the merchants scampering back to the ship in panic. And then, to my relief, the rocks decided to fly away. By my, but my instinct told me to cast off at once and make for the open sea. My instinct was correct. Soon after, the rocks reappeared, each carrying an enormous boulder in its claws. The male rock was the first to drop his boulder, but it narrowly missed us, although the force with which it hit the water was enough to send the ship pitching and tossing madly. Almost before we could recover, the female rock let, her, let fall her boulder, which crashed through the poop of the ship, splintering the rudder into twenty pieces. Yes, we can all stop now and laugh at the poop of the ship. The poop deck, everyone's favorite deck on a ship, except if you're on a cruise ship. The vessel foundered at once, and we were all flung off the deck into the sea. Good fortune was once more on my side. A large plank from the stricken ship was just within arm's reach, and I grabbed hold of it and managed to straddle it, paddling hard with my feet until the winds and the waves threw me up on the shore of another island. When I had recovered sufficiently to take stock of my new surroundings, I was relieved to find that fate had cast me up on a most delightful shore. The trees were weighed down with fruits of all descriptions, and the air was scented with a profusion of flowers. So I ate my fill and drank from the cool streams and sank exhausted into a deep sleep. The next morning, refreshed, I explored a little further. Supposing the island to be totally uninhabited, no one's on it, uninhabited, I was surprised to come upon a very old man, wearing a palm-frond waistcloth, sitting alone by a spring. I assumed that he must be one of the merchants who had also survived the shipwreck, and saluted him and wished him well. He returned my greeting with a sign of his hands, but uttered not a word. Venerable sir, I said, what causes you to sit here, and how can I be of help? He shook his head pathetically, and made a sign as if to ask me to take him upon my shoulders and carry him across the stream. Having pity on the aged man, I willingly crouched down, hoisted him on my shoulders, and stepped across the stream. There I crouched again to allow him to dismount from my shoulders, to get off my shoulders, to dismount. But instead, he wrapped his legs tightly around my neck. When I looked more closely and saw that they were as dark and rough as buffalo's hide, I felt alarmed and tried to shake him off, but he gripped even more tightly until I found it hard to breathe and felt my head swimming. And then, having shown me who was master, he made signals with his hands and squeezed and kicked with his legs to indicate that I should carry him from one tree to another to allow him to pluck the best fruits. If I misunderstood an instruction or moved too slowly from tiredness or lost my footing and stumbled, he would drum his feet into my ribs, making me cry out in pain. For days and nights I had to undergo this torture. At no time did he get down from my shoulders. At night, when he felt tired, he would give the signal for us to stretch out on the ground. But even in sleep, he kept his legs tightly lock locked around my throat. When he was ready to move in the morning, he would rouse me with a beating from his heels that was ten times more painful than palm rods. I cursed myself again and deeply resented having taken pity on this vile creature, and vowed that I would never do another good deed for any man as long as I lived. My life was so wretched that there were times when I honestly wished I might be able to die, but still I wearily dragged on. Then one day I had an idea to relieve my existence of a little of its misery. I had been commanded to a halt at a spot where there were many vines and gourds, some of them quite dry. While the old man was busy picking fruits, I plucked a great dry gourd, wrenched off the top, scooped out the inside and cleaned it, and then gathered some grapes and squeezed them into the gourd until it was full of juice. And then I plugged the mouth of the gourd and let it left it hanging in the sun. 
Several days later, when we were passing that way again, I took the opportunity to take a sip of the liquid. It had become a strong wine, and it was most refreshing. Every time we passed that spot, I would taste a little to ease my aches and pains. Then one day, the old man looked down and noticed me drinking. Angrily, he drummed with his heels and waved with his arms as if to demand, What are you doing that for? I tried to explain that the wine made me feel happier, and to show him what I meant, I took another swig and began to dance with him on my shoulders, weaving among the trees and clapping my hands and singing. At once he wanted to try it for himself, so I had no choice but to hand him the gourd. It pleased him so much that he drank it down to, to the last drop and, and immediately began to feel light-headed. He started to sway violently and clap his hands. At last he became so drunk that I could feel his muscles relaxing around my neck. Seizing the opportunity, I grabbed hold of his legs and flung him backward off my shoulder, hardly able to believe my good luck. When I looked around, I saw that in his fall, his head had struck a large rock. He was dead. Then, feeling much more at ease than I had felt for a long time, I returned to the bit beach to keep a lookout for ships in the distance. Many days passed, but at last a ship arrived and some passengers landed. When they saw me, they wanted to know how I came to be on that remote island, and I told them everything that had happened since I had set sail from Basra. In Arabian Nights, in these stories... There's always the moment where someone meets someone else and it's like, why tell me your story? Because um, this is all about storytelling culture. Oh, my plug. Ah! <laughs> oh well, get on and unplug here. Uh, it's all about telling stories. And so there's always someone who meets somebody and is like, well, it is your story. It's like, and oftentimes in the story, there's another story. It's like, let me tell you this. I met this man and he told me this amazing story. Let me tell you. But let's go back to this story. They told me how fortunate I was They told me how fortunate I was to have escaped alive from my last encounter. It seems that I had met the old man of the sea, and that no one who had felt his legs around their neck had ever survived. They had all died of exhaustion beneath him, and then he had eaten their wasted bodies. Then, congratulating me again on my good fortune, they offered me something to eat and drink and gave me some fresh clothes, which I was badly in need of and took me aboard their ship. After many days, we landed at a place they called the City of Apes. It had many imposing houses, all of which faced the sea, and had a single gate studded with iron nails. It was explained to me that every evening at dusk, the inhabitants came out of the gate and put it to sea in boats, passing the night on the water for fear of being attacked by apes from the mountain. Although I had every reason to be weary, wary of the ape kind, I ventured on land to inspect the city, since it was still broad daylight. But to my great distress, the ship sailed off without me. It seemed that yet again I was the author of my own misfortunes. Luckily, one of the townsfolk, identifying me as a stranger, came out to greet me and offer help. When he heard that I had been stranded, he immediately offered me a spare place in his boat, for if you remain here at night, he said, the apes will sh be sure to kill you. And so I spent the night in the safety of his boat, about one mile out to sea, and in the morning we rowed back to the city with all the other little boats. I learned that at daybreak, having eaten what they could of the produce of the gardens, the apes always went back to their mountains until the following night. Another of the townsfolk, taking pity in my plight, asked me if I had any trade or profession that I could practice while I was waiting for another ship to take me home. When I told him I was a merchant and a man of some substance who, until just recently, had owned his own ship, he handed me a cotton bag. Take this bag and fill it with pebbles from the beach, he said, and then join the small band of town folks to whom I shall introduce you. Do exactly what they do, and I guarantee that you shall earn your daily bread and not go home empty-handed. He escorted me down to the beach, where I collected my pebbles, and then he entrusted me to the care of a little group of townsfolk, all of whom were carrying similar cotton bags. They gave me a friendly welcome and took me with them to a broad river bed, where there were some tall trees with trunks so smooth that no human could climb them. There were many apes sleeping in the shade of these trees, and when they heard us approaching, they swarmed up the trees to take shelter among the topmost branches. 
I then noticed that my companions were opening their bags and taking out pebbles. To my surprise, they began to throw these pebbles at the apes. And to my greater surprise, the angry apes began to retaliate by picking the coconuts off the trees and throwing them down at us. Of course, we began to pick up the nuts, and even before I'd used up all my pebbles in my bag, my companions and I had gathered as many coconuts as we could carry. Back in the city, I went to the house of the friendly man who had presented me to the group and offered him the valuable nuts, but he declined graciously and gave me some good advice. Make this your trade until you can return home, he said. Every day, go out with your pebbles and bring your coconuts back here to leave in my storehouse, for which I shall give you a key. Sell and use for yourself the very ripest, the others with good fortune you can trade with, trade with on your return home. And he wished me luck. And so every day I went out with the coconut gatherers and did good business in the market. By occupying myself in this way, I enjoyed my stay in the city. But all the same, I was glad when a ship eventually put in, put in at the port and I was able to arrange a passage back to my homeland. I thanked my friend for all his kindnesses. Kindnesses is kindnesses. That's a hard word to say. Kindnesses. More than one kindness. Kindnesses is kindnesses. And embarked with my new merchandise and high spirits. We sailed from island to island and sea to sea, and everywhere we went I bartered profitably. One of the islands we visited was famed for its cloves and cinnamon and pepper, all of which I bought in great quantities. Cloves and cinnamon and pepper. Spice trade. Remember that? When we were studying early uh, European history and how they went off to the Middle East to get their pepper and cinnamon and cloves? Why, yes, you do. I was told, I was told how, besides each cluster of pepper berries, there grows a great leaf that shades it from the sun and protects it from the water in the rainy season, but then droops down when it is no longer needed. We also called in at the island of Al-Usarat, where the Cape Cosmorin aloe wood comes from, and also at another very long island, five days' journey from one end to the other, which produces even better aloe wood than the Comorin. But unfortunately, that, but unfortunately, the inhabitants are a foul, immoral lot. From there, we visited some pearl fisheries, where I presented some of the divers with coconuts, saying, Dive and bring me some good luck. And indeed they did, fetching up a great store of priceless pearls from the depths of the lagoon. Finally, I got back to Basra and thence to Baghdad. Baghdad is another city in Iraq that's still there and has been there for thousands of years. It's where we invented uh, writing. Baghdad, that area, 10,000 years ago. Blah, blah, blah. Finally, I got back to Basra and thence, thence to Baghdad, where once more I gathered all my friends and relatives about me to celebrate my safe return. I could afford to make generous presents to all and distributed alms among the poor. And that is the story of my fifth voyage. Tomorrow I shall tell you the story of my sixth. Then after they had all feasted, Sinbad the sailor gave Sinbad the porter a purse of a hundred cold dinars, bidding him to be sure to return in good time the following day. The next morning the two men talked together until all the other guests had arrived and food had been passed around, and then began the story of the sixth voyage of Sinbad the Sailor. Ah, it's amazing how as much is packed into that one story. In that one story, you had giant birds, the rocks. You had the old man in the sea, so the old man who climbs on your neck and works you to death. The city of apes, and then pearl divers. Pearl divers weren't that exciting. But in one story, you had apes, uh, murderous apes, giant eagles, and a really mean old man. And that's just one story. There are seven. All right. Enjoy the story. Write your write your uh, write five sentences using five words that made you go huh. And enjoy.